Invasion 2. Castle. The game plan for our second invasion borrows many elements from the first. For example, we're maintaining the Nestrian layout, and a lot of our buildings are occupying roughly the same positions, especially on the flanks, although the specific placements of several buildings are different. On our left side, we're facing some heavy cavalry in the form of Armored Blow Great Knights and Seal Strength Mechanists. Our magical units can dispose of the Great Knights very easily, and then the Mechanists won't be much trouble. Opposite them, we face a group of Flyers, not Wyvern Riders this time, but promoted Malignites with Trample and Falconites with Darting Blow. Curiously, the Malignites only have Tomes. As far as I can recall, every other Malignite in this game carries at least one axe. The real threat in this mission is down south. The Merchant Boss is the most powerful attacker we've ever seen. He carries a Silver Hankyu, a 1-2 range Yumi with massive might, giving him 44 displayed attack. He also possesses a Master Seal, which he drops, and three gold bars. Those are fuel for his Spendthrift skill. When he attacks on his turn, Spendthrift consumes one of those gold bars to make him deal 10 more damage and take 10 less. He effectively gets 35 defense, 28 resistance, and 54 attack. Moreover, certain blow makes it all but impossible to dodge him, and he has Jantium for good measure. Flanking the boss are a pair of Demoiselle maids who carry silver daggers and hunter's knives. One of them has an enfeeble staff, and the other has freeze. There's also a pair of lesser merchants. These two may be weaker than their boss, but they still have spendthrift. However, they don't have certain blow. That difference is very important. Those merchants are accompanied by two more maids. These have seal speed rather than demoiselle, and they don't carry hunter's knives, but they do have freeze and enfeeble again. The villagers are fairly weak. Each of them has underdog, and that skill does apply against most of our team. It would be pretty annoying if it weren't for the free hit bonuses we get from the mess hall. Most of the villagers are equipped only with steel naginatas. Two of them have sword catchers too. What's especially scary in this formation is hiding behind the boss. You can see the green area representing offensive staff range. In back, there's a maid who has counter and entrap. If you're careless enough to leave a unit in range, the boss can run up and switch to the maid, who can then pull said unit down here to be crippled by the other maids, and then obliterated by the merchants. We've just recently started to encounter enemy staff users who have weapons. There's an important aspect of their AI that you need to know. If they have a valid target to attack directly, enemies will always opt to do that instead of using their offensive staffs. So, if we place at least one unit in the red area and not just the green area, and that unit is someone the maid can actually damage, we never have to worry about the entrap staff. We constructed our fortress accordingly. The entire southern bridge, all seven tiles of it, is permanently blocked. We've accomplished that by placing two indestructible buildings on either side of the fire orb. We won't use the fire orb for its intended function. Its value lies in the fact that it is also indestructible, but it's only one tile wide. Because it's so small, the enemies, including the maids, are able to attack through it. However, they can only do so one at a time, and they can't get past it. Behind the fire orb, we place the pillars, which provide damage reduction and 10 points of avoid to any units who might be fighting the merchants or maids on the other side. The merchants and the villagers can spend 5 movement points to walk on water. Therefore, we've reinforced the sides of our battle station with our statues, the idea being to slow down the invaders and to alter their pathing by changing their distance calculations. As in our first invasion, we want most of these southern enemies to run off to one side. This time that's to the left, not the right. For that purpose, we block the eastern bridge with a mountain. The western crossing is impeded by the woods, but not to the same degree. More importantly, this path is the shortest way to reach a bonus building, the accessory shop. Ordinarily, I would keep the buildings lodged up against the waterways, but we've nudged the accessory shop one space to the left to encourage the villagers to run all the way around through the southwest and not to try swimming past the arena. Because they can walk on water, some of the villagers can avoid the woods by going directly across the moat. But they can only do that two at a time, so the moat has the useful effect of stringing them out. North of the accessory shop, we're using the lottery shop to establish a choke point, just as we once did with the mine. That will help us to corral the enemies on turn one. On the other side, we're doing something similar with the prison. 
That's only a temporary obstacle, but because we've upgraded it, it should take two attacks to bring it down. As before, the prison is very expendable. We're only too happy to get rid of its crit bonus. North of there, we have our most important buildings, the Records Hall and the Private Quarters, both at level 2. Respectively, those reduce the damage we take by 5 and increase the damage we deal by 5. Once again, we've adjusted the position of the Private Quarters to produce the correct movement results from the enemies. But this time, we're not using it as bait. Judged from the southern entrance, the Private Quarters would be the second closest bonus building after the Accessory Shop. However, our grave obstructs the shortest path, making it two tiles longer. That difference should make a couple of key enemies consistently decide to go left by the arena, and not right past the smithy. Before we begin, we have to move some units around. Corrin will be first to man our turret. He's the one who will have to deal with most of the initial wave. Elise can stay put. Her job will be to kill the northernmost Great Knight and to lock in the mechanist below. Percy will support Corrin. Selina's already at the right spot, but Lazo should go south to attack the enemy flyers from the other side. Odin will start by helping against the cavalry, but eventually he'll have to cross over to the east to work on his support with Laszlo. And since he's at level 20, he needs to promote. For Odin, the choice between Sorcerer and Dark Knight is normally a very obvious one. Only Sorcerers can use Nosferatu, and that's what Odin does best. But our purposes are a little unusual. We don't care too much about Odin's immediate combat prospects, but we do want him to pass Vantage to his daughter and therefore we want to make his transition to the samurai tree as smooth as possible. To do that, we want to start building his sword rank. In the east, we can use Mozu against the Flyers. Felicia wants to stay on this side, but she should swap with Keaton, who in turn should trade places with Leo. Leo wants to earn support with Odin and Felicia both, and for his part, Keaton wants to do the same with Mozu and Laszlo. That's everyone, so we're ready to go. When Korn occupies his battle station, he has the option to use either his Leaven Sword or his Forged Thunder Tome. In principle, the Thunder Tome would be better because it gives Korn much more avoid. He's about to be attacked twice by the Parried Up Merchants, and he must dodge at least one of those attacks. The two closest maids will also attack him, but the boss and the two more distant maids won't. They're scripted not to activate until turn 5. The Paired Merchants only have 100 hit, minus 10 from the effect of the Einar shop and 10 more due to the Pillars, so 80. They'll lose another 10 points from that figure if Korn wields a tome, but they gain 5 if he uses the Leaven Sword instead. Unfortunately, Korn doesn't only need to avoid the merchants. He must also one round the two maids. He and Percy are a tiny bit shy of their averages in magic and strength, respectively, so the Thunder Tome won't be powerful enough to do that. The Leaven Sword is needed. Selina blocks the northern route when she attacks the uppermost malignant. Laszlo's goal is not to kill this Falcon Knight, so we don't want any crits in this battle. Because they saw so much combat together in Chapter 17, Keaton and Mozu need just one shared battle in this mission to unlock their B support, assuming Mozu actually gets her dual strike. Doing fine on my own. Even if she hadn't, this next attack would earn that single support point anyway. I want to see what happens. <laughs> 
We've trapped these last two flyers. Instead of attacking either of our units, they'll both try to destroy the prison. Okay, let's go! Leo still wants to improve his sword rank. This is a convenient opportunity for him to do that, but he'll have to switch back to Tome shortly. We can handle this. We can block in the northern mechanist, but the southern one must be removed now, or else he'll destroy the accessory shop. Chosen hero arrives! I'll do what no one else can. More to come! You, uh, passed your test! Elise lunges the Great Knight, thereby sealing in the Mechanist and preventing him from attacking Odin at range. We dodged the first spendthrift shot, so now we don't have to worry about avoiding the second one. Corn will survive either way. I believe in you. This time we are able to use a tome. Keaton has his one support point with Mozu in hand. He's looking for the full three points with Laszlo. This is their second battle where they're directly supporting one another, though Laszlo was also adjacent to Keaton when Keaton used Mozu's dual strike on turn one. That means they're 60% of the way to their goal. I really don't care. Laszlo's second priority behind Keaton is Selena, and his third is Odin. Having already fulfilled all of her support goals, Mozu can run toward the Central Island to help out over there. Felicia can afford to take some damage to help feed experience and sword training to Odin. We can handle this. Such are the whims of fate! I was here first! Amazing. Now that the Mechanist is dead, Odin should make his way over to Laszlo. Percy has given Korn four dual strikes through five rounds of combat. That's more than enough to produce three support points, unlocking the B support between the two of them. Percy can go away now to be replaced by Leo and eventually Elise. For the time being, Elise will go south, where she can intercept a few of the villagers. 
While she waits for them to arrive, she can use our first partner seal to become a Dark Mage. Elise's biggest weakness as a combat unit is her low accuracy. Heartseeker mostly rectifies that, and as a mage, Elise will have a lot of raw power. This is a major financial commitment. There's no rule saying we have to keep giving resources to Elise, and by doing this, we're denying those resources to other units who might be more important to the team later on. But aside from improving Elise's considerable combat potential, we're also hoping to guarantee excellent stat inheritance for Elise's daughter by giving Elise the highest possible magic growth. By hitching a ride with Odin, Leo can make his way over to Corinth, who's looking for one support point with him. We can do this together. You are not alone. After that little maneuver, Corinth and Leo can each cast fire to incinerate the second merchant. count on you. You'll be all right. Korn is still safe from the boss and his maid companions for another two turns. Ah, fine. In order for Odin to cross over to the right side of the castle on time, Selina must come help. Laszlo and Keaton can stay where they are, but Moses should continue westward. I'll go with you. I guess I'll save your tails. The only villager who's not going through the southwestern section of the castle is the one who decided to support the merchant on the previous enemy phase. By chance, he's one of the villagers with a sword catcher. That's convenient for us, but it's not at all critical. The boss will activate soon. When he does, Korn needs to be ready. He needs a lot more HP. To that end, we're finally using the elixir we got in Chapter 10. To reach level 20, Elise must fight and kill two villagers. She doesn't want to take any extra dual strikes, though, so she should take one step to the left before waiting. Percy can earn some free axe experience by supporting Elise. He also wants the Bolt Axe for later. Leo has done everything he needs to do with Korn, so he's free to head back west, where he can fight the reinforcements who will arrive there in two turns. Felicia shall wait nearby, close to Korn, but also within reach of Percy and Elise. I won't let you down. It's all right. We want these villagers to hit Elise. So, rather bizarrely, it hurts us that Underdog doesn't work on her right now. Elise is the only unit we have for whom that's true. If Elise's HP gets low enough, We'll be able to manipulate the AI later on by showing the enemies a kill that they can't actually achieve. But in the alternative, if she were to dodge enough attacks to make no enemies see lethal damage, that would also be fine. The worst case is a middle ground where she's only moderately wounded. The arrival of the reinforcements also marks the activation of the boss and his maids. Starting now, on turn 5, they're aggressive. So are the two additional merchants who just arrived. Those again have spendthrift, and they each carry a pair of gold bars to expend.
Interestingly, the Great Knights are not aggressive. They will actively avoid combat. Their only goals are the destruction of our bonus buildings and the seizure of our throne. They won't even stop to kill anyone when given the chance. The same is true for the other mounted reinforcements who are yet to arrive. Some wyvern lords in the west and some dark knights in the east. When this villager makes landfall to the north, he'll have to destroy one of our statues. Most of the time, he seems to choose the northern statue, and that's what we want. If he destroys the one to the left instead, that forces a reset. I suspect there's a way to organize our buildings that can prevent that, but I haven't worked it out yet. Elise needs to get out of here. She has bigger fish to fry than just the villagers. After handing Elise to Felicia, Percy will wait right here. What should we do? Like Odin, Elise gets to choose between Sorcerer and Dark Knight. The difference for Elise is that she's not really cut out for Nosferatu taking, since she doesn't have the skill for it, and she often doesn't have great defense either. For most purposes, Dark Knight makes more sense. But as I said before, we're trying to maximize Elise's magic growth to ensure that her kid will inherit two points of magic, not just one. To do that, Elise must gain four more points of magic over her next five levels. For that reason, we're picking Sorcerer. Its magic growth is 15 points higher. Funnily enough, Nosferatu is still going to be useful for Elise, partly because of its healing powers, but also partly because it can't double. It will allow Elise to wound but not kill enemies, which is something she usually can't do with fire. So we do want Elise to reach D rank in Tomes pretty quickly. Well... If Korn is going to fight the boss, there's no real hope of dodging, but we do want to make sure Korn deals as much damage as he can on the counterattack. For that, he needs to use the Leaven Sword, and he needs to be fast enough to follow up. That requires 24 speed. Korn currently has 25. That looks good, but the Enfeebled Maid can drop him down to 21. We have to give Korn at least 3 extra speed with a pair-up partner. Felicia is on hand to do that. Leo continues riding west, anticipating the arrival of the Wyvern Lords. Corrin only needs Felicia for a single round of combat. After that, we'll be able to pass her off to Percy, who can bring her over to Leo. On the other side of things, the Awakening Trio and Keaton must arrange themselves to fight the Dark Knights who are about to appear. They have a couple of objectives besides earning the proper support points with each other. Selena's goal is to reach level 5 and learn Rally Defense before our next mission, so we want to feed her extra experience with dual strikes whenever possible. Odin is looking for sword experience wherever he can get it. The reason why we're using the wait command on all these units separately, and not using the end turn option in the menu, is that we don't want to miss a chance to activate Profiteer by accident. That goes for Collector, too, but we're allowed infinite castle resources, so that skill doesn't really matter for us. Since that one villager cooperated with us by destroying the correct statue, most of the risk in our strategy is now gone. The enemy movement should all be consistent from here on out. If our goal is to maximize Elise's magic, and we only have a couple of missions in which to do it, then obviously we have to give her a substantial amount of experience so she can level up and realize her awesome 90% growth rate. The biggest source we have for that experience is the boss. While Elise is killing him, she can build some extra support with Korn. Notice that Korn only did one round of combat with Felicia, the same as Leo. The difference is that Leo gave him a dual strike, whereas Felicia did not give him a dual guard, so Leo reached the minimum to earn one support point, and Felicia didn't. The boss gives us another master seal, the second to last until we can build the level 3 staff store. Viewers, which unit do you think is getting it? The only unit who can attack Elise is the Entrap Maid, who will body block all the other enemies. In these situations, the AI is capable of moving one unit out of the way if another unit sees lethal damage, 
and the merchants are strong enough to kill Elise, but they're too far away to reach her right now. Elise can easily survive any of the maids, so she's perfectly safe where she is. Muzu should pass Felicia over to Percy. I'm here to help. Leo can kill the closest Wyvern Lord using Felicia's dual strike. It looks stupid to leave a unit with as little defense as Felicia in range of two Wyvern Lords, but as I said, they're not interested in fighting. They only care about the throne and the bonus buildings. They would ignore Felicia even if she hadn't dodged the mechanist on turn two, in which case she would have 10 HP right now. Go, go, go! Keaton will use Selena's dual strike rather than Laszlo's. After this, he and Laszlo will have fought twice together with one dual strike, and twice merely adjacent. They'll need to support one another in one more round of combat with a dual strike or dual guard to qualify for the full three support points. Thanks, I guess. Let's go! Laszlo wants to weaken but not kill the second Dark Knight, so he has to change Selena's weapon. Come on, smile for me! Beast Killer robs Odin of a dual strike opportunity. Selina will use her forged bronze lance instead, even though that means taking a lot of damage that she could otherwise prevent. secures the one support point he's looking for with each of Laszlo and Selina by using Laszlo as his partner on this attack with Selina adjacent. That'll put both of them ahead of Felicia. My darkness was darker than yours! Elise gets enfeebled first, and then we lose the accessory shop and the Einaryar shop, which gave us bonuses to dodge and avoid. As a result, the Entrapped Maid's attack on Elise is quite likely to hit. We've got this. Since the accessory shop has been destroyed, the shortest path between the merchants and any bonus building now runs north. We want the merchants to follow the villager over the moat. Now that the statues above have been demolished, they can run north together as soon as they're across. Before they get there, we'll deal with the villager by having Mozu pull him to the right. Meanwhile, Elise will take out the maid on the other side of the fire orb. But that will expose her to attack from the other maids and the two merchants. The merchants would happily try to kill her, but she's so low on HP that the maids also see lethal damage. With the weapon triangle advantage their daggers afford them, the maids are much more accurate against Elise than the merchants are. When the AI tries for a kill, it prefers to do so using the most accurate attack available, so the maids will have priority. They won't actually be able to kill Elise because her guard gauge will be full, and the next maid will occupy the space south of the fire orb again, so the merchants will have no choice but to ignore Elise and cross the water. By standing next to Elise, Mozu gets to use her dual strike against the villager, and Mozu in turn gives Elise four points of hit, making her perfectly accurate against the maids. I believe. Not bad. Not bad. Hey.
We do need to hunt down the Wyvern Lords before they get away from us. Felicia can reach the closest Wyvern by pairing up with Percy, and then Leo can deal with the other one. You're lucky I'm here! That went well! Yes! What are you waiting for? We've got trouble! Yeah. Here's one more! I'm impressed! On the Eastern Front, where we've already eliminated all the Dark Knights, the team can disperse. Most of this crew should head south to deal with the solitary Great Knight and eventually the Maids, but Odin will want to go west to reunite with Elites. Don't do anything dumb. I won't let you down. Conveniently, it's the Freeze Maid who acts first. We'd rather be enfeebled than frozen. Since the heavy hitters have finally crossed the moat, we can't hold our little fortress any longer. It's time to retreat. Along the way, we want Elise to finish off the villager. She'll have to interpose herself between that villager and her teammates, and she needs to heal herself to survive his attack. We also don't want her to get too many support points with Corrin, lest she surpass Percy. In the West, Felicia and Leo can rack up a ton of experience and weapon training by teaming up in this choke point, equipping some of their weakest weapons, and whittling down the approaching villagers. I'll fight too. Both of the Swordcatcher villagers are dead, so Leo doesn't have to worry about them. Leo's bronze sword does allow the villagers to damage him. If not, he could equip the Kodachi instead. As previously stated, Odin will head west toward Elise and company. I'll handle this miscreant! Selina can wait here, where she's in range of both maids, but neither merchant. Because she's down to 5 HP, Selina must follow Elise's lead and use a Vulnerary. The Great Knight won't attack unless we completely block his path, but Keaton and Laza will back up anyway, just to be cautious. Yeah, I gotcha. Come on, smile for me. This maid wouldn't be able to damage Selina at all if she hadn't been enfeebled first. Having too much defense is a real problem sometimes. We're obviously going to kill these last two merchants on player phase, when they can't use Spendthrift and they can't even fight back. When we do that, we want to maximize Elise's experience gain. She should kill the first one, and then Mozu and Odin should each use her dual strike against the second one. For them to do that while attacking at melee range, Elise must end her turn on a diagonal relative to the second merchant. 
and therefore she should not attack the first merchant from the side opposite the second this. one. After the debuff from her dagger, Felicia actually deals damage with her dual strikes, so she can earn experience from Leo's next attack. Now she steals the kill from him. Percy flies east. He'll come around to help against the two great knights approaching from the southwest. Unlike the villagers, they'll veer right toward the throne. Selina's task is to fight the final maid, who will have to go southeast to eventually reach the records hall. But first, we need to deal with the third great knight. I will protect you. This attack is the last one Keaton and Laszlo need. We'll be just fine. Watch this. I've got your back. Selena doesn't have a lot to gain by building support with Keaton, but it doesn't hurt. You die on me, I'll kill you. <laughs> Elise should kill both great knights. Percy can use his hammer to support her against the first one. Mozo allows Elise to cast fire one more time, and she also serves to block the bridge without killing the Great Knight on enemy phase. I am Fate's accomplice. Corin will run northeast. He's not needed in combat anymore, and now that we're approaching the end of this mission, we are ready to sandbag for extra experience. If we destroy the private quarters, we'll reduce our own damage, which would allow some of our units, particularly Selina and Odin, to see even more combat. The treehouse has 35 HP. With the Levin Sword, Korn has enough attack to demolish it in one hit. Stay on your toes. It'll be fine. 
not paying attention? Um, shall we? Don't worry. Miss <laughs> Felicia has leveled up twice. Yes. With his next round of combat, Leo should also gain a second level. I want to see what happens. Let's win this one, all right? Let's end this here. What should we do? to come. Seal magic is a pretty weak skill, but it does help Leo tank mages if he doesn't simply one round them. Such are the winds of fate. Step one on this turn is for Corn to do some remodeling. Check out my skills. Leo and Felicia should evacuate. We're reserving the three surviving villagers for Odin. He'll be supported by Percy, who can equip the bolt axe he got from Elise to minimize his damage. Odin waits just southwest of the entrance to the staff store, two spaces away from two enemies. Here, all three enemies can attack him from any side. Ready for action. Percy can hit either of the two healthy villagers. If one of them had a sword catcher, that villager would be his target. We would like the villagers to fight Odin twice each, but Odin can only afford to take one hit from a sword catcher. Selena still takes damage from the mate. That's good. She can fight her again on enemy phase. Selena sits at the eastern edge of the maid's range, where Laszlo can support her. Let's go. Keaton can also stand by. Thanks to the adjacency bonuses from Laszlo and Keaton, Selena has perfect accuracy. Champions of justice! Ah! Only one chance! Justice never loses! Ah! Don't forget me! We have one more turn to pass before we'll wrap things up. Most of the team has nothing to do, but Selena will want to weaken the maid again before she kills her. Show me what you've got. Selena's strength has recovered so that she now deals 14 damage. The maid only has 15 HP, so for her to survive, Laszlo and Keaton can't dual strike for Selena or even rally for her. They could be adjacent and unequipped, but that could mess up the support between Laszlo and Keaton, so Selena's going it alone. If he simply waits, Odin will kill all but one of these villagers on enemy phase. He can reduce the damage he takes by killing one of them right now. He would have to do that if there were a sword catcher anywhere. Stand back, 
citizen! <laughs> Ooh, tough one. Muzu backs off to avoid pulling any of the villagers away from Odin. Everyone else can wait where they are. Let's go. I'm with you. I'll do my best. Let's take them out! Odin has almost reached level 3. This is the perfect time to use the heart seal he's been carrying. You are not alone. He'll become a master of arms. By doing this when he's really close to level 3, Odin will earn the first samurai skill, Duelist Blow, almost immediately. At level 4, he'll get Vantage, and then at level 5, he'll pick up Seal Strength. If we wanted to, we could then give him another seal, a heart seal, or a partner seal, to get him back into a tome class. This method makes it really easy for Odin to pick up three of the four Master of Arms skills. Vantage alone is a great asset when Odin has tomes, but the final skill from the Master of Arms class at level 15, which is Life and Death, is a game changer. Clearing out the first three skills early makes it very easy to pick that up later. Selina will finally kill the maid. Keaton can support her while she does that. You're hopeless without me. Don't do anything dumb. <laughs> Selena has reached level 5 right on schedule. Yikes. Laszlo, Mozu, Felicia, Leo, Corin, Elise, and Percy are all just waiting for Odin to finish off the final villager. Thus, Odin acquires his first samurai skill right away. He's on track to learn more very soon, but not too soon because he won't be joining us in Chapter 18, and neither will Leo or Felicia or Elise. Still, this has been very productive. We've just gotten a lot of training that should make our next few missions much easier. Next time we go to the neutral land of Izumo. There, Korn will unveil his secret plan to stop the invasion of Hoshido and establish a lasting peace. But the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry.